And the rest of us, if you would, get your Bibles this morning and turn with me to Psalms 51. Psalms 51. Ever did something wrong? Thought you got away with it and somebody confronted you about it later on? <laughs> Rich, I didn't. I didn't come to preach at you this morning, but uh, it seems God's got your number this morning. It doesn't feel good, does it? The embarrassment of it all, realizing that somebody knew all along that uh, you had done wrong, that your life wasn't right, that you were a fake, a phony, been found out, that's never a good thing. To experience the psalmist this morning experienced much the same thing David had had the affair with Bathsheba made all the plans to bring her husband back and her husband being the noble guy doesn't fall for it and so he sends him back to the front line so Uriah could be killed and then he takes Bathsheba and everything's good right Nobody is none the wiser, and it's, uh, it's all good. But God knew. God knew exactly what had gone on in his life. And he, said, and he tells Nathan. And Nathan, the prophet, goes and confronts David and says, God knows what you did. And out of that realization, David is brought back into a saving relationship with God into a relationship that was once broken because of sin the sin that he had had with Bathsheba and God sends Nathan David realizes there's a problem realizes he's been found out and he needs to confess that sin and so he does and that's the psalm that we read this morning that he cries out to God. And that's what we want to look at this morning. How many of us understand that no matter what we do, where we go, or what we say, even if no one else is around, God hears. God knows. We're not going to hide anything in this life from Him, nor in the life to come. It is important for us to understand this morning that sin separates us from God. It takes us out of the will that He has for our life. And as a Christian, we always try and strive to be in the center of God's will for our life. Is that not correct? It is. And so, if it's not, it should be. The goal is to be where God wants us to be, when He wants us there, doing what He wants us to do. But every one of us miss that mark sometimes. That's the honest truth of it. In fact, over in Romans in chapter 3, and I'm surprising Rick because he thought I was going to go here later. I did too, Rick, sorry. <clears throat> over in Romans in chapter 3 in verse 23, Paul tells the church at Rome that every one of them, every one of us this morning, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us in this room has been there and done that. It is important for us to understand this morning that sin separates us from that which we desire the most, and that is to be in the very presence of God and to have Him be at the very center of our lives. That sin, even the ones that you think nobody knows about, still separates us from God. Let's read this morning over in Psalms. This is the prayer that David cries out from his heart. He says this, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity 
and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts, you teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. It's a great prayer, isn't it? It's a prayer that, that many of us should pray often. It is a prayer that brings one from a sinful state that is separated from God into a right state of righteousness before God. It's a, great, it's a great prayer. There's some things this morning that I think we can draw from there that'll help us to understand we need to make sure that sin does not separate us from that which we want most. And that is to be in the very presence of God in our life. The first thing that this morning I want us to notice there uh, in those first few verses is that the psalmist realizes there's a problem. You know, they say that the, the first step to solving a problem in your life is to admit that you have one. Forever, I knew I had a, a blood pressure problem. I knew I had blood sugar problems, and forever I just ignored it. The problem never went away. It only got worse. You see, that's the problem with sin. Sin doesn't go away on its own. It has to be forgiven. It has to be cleansed from us. And if it isn't, it just gets worse. How many of us realize this morning that sin will take you further than you ever wanted to go and it'll keep you there much longer than you ever thought you'd be there? You see, because once there's one sin that you have to hide, then there's another one you have to hide, then there's another one, and then a lie has to be told and you have to cover things up. How many of us realize that that's not how God intended for our relationship to be? It's important this morning to understand you're not above sin. That's the truth of it. We're all, as Paul says, sinful and have fallen short of that glory. You're in that number. This morning. Pastor, I'm a good person. I give, I give money to good charities. I never talk bad about people. I understand. And there's still sin. There's still sin. And that sin still separates you from God. It's important to understand a little white lie is a lie. Amen? It's important for us to understand that that little sin is a sin. But it really didn't hurt anybody. It hurt you. And it hurt your relationship with Jesus. It's important for us to understand this morning that sin is sin. And sin and God cannot coexist in the same space. Does that make sense? The psalmist realized this morning he has a problem. It's a sin problem. And the very first thing he does is he cries out to God and says, Just have mercy on me. Don't give me what I deserve. I know what I deserve. But don't give me that. Have mercy on me. Cleanse me. Make me new again. Take it away from me. I know I've sinned against you and you alone. It is only you who can set forth rules that we need to follow that I can sin against. And it is only you who can extend grace and mercy and forgiveness in this situation. You see, sometimes 
we have to make our kids say sorry, don't we? You go tell your sister you're sorry. Sorry. You think they're sorry? I think they're sorry that you made them say they were sorry. You see, if we never recognize that we've missed the mark, we'll never get better at hitting the mark. If we don't recognize that we're off course, we'll never get back on course. It is important for us as Christians to make sure that we're always on that course that leads to God. And sin derails us off of that course. The psalmist recognized God derailed. And he needed to get back on course. It's important for us to understand. And, and, I, and I love Christians. I want you to know I do. But we got a problem. We, uh, we're scared to death of this thing. Oh, we're not scared of the wood or that the slack will come off on our clothes or anything like that. What we're scared of is that somebody else will see us there. That's what we're scared of. And somebody else will think, what did they do? And if you're thinking that this morning, shame on you. Shame on you. What you ought to be thinking is, Somebody else is drawing closer to God. Somebody else is, is getting their life right. And you ought to be singing the same song we sang this morning. There's a new name written down in glory. That's what we ought to be doing. But we've got a problem because we don't want to admit we have sin. Because if we admit we have sin... We have to end up here. And whether it's in the shape of a piece of wood up here in the front of a church, or whether it's over a steering wheel, or whether it's beside your bed, or laying in bed, or at the dining room table, or wherever you may recognize that there's sin in your life, that has to become your altar. It has to become the place where you meet God. And if you can't recognize, for fear of embarrassment or whatever, it's not going to take the sin away. There's only one way to get the sin away, and that is to have God cleanse it. It has to be removed. The last 10 or 12 days, I've been living with Mike. Mike's my, my cyst on my back, I named him. He's been with me long enough now. But I've been taking medicine the whole time trying to get him to go away, and he's just about gone. Uh, and... Uh, here in, here in a, another month or so, we're going to make him move out. And uh, if he doesn't want to go peacefully, we're going to take him by force. But I know this. He's been there for 15 years. You know why he's been there for 15 years? Because I didn't want to go to the doctor. He wasn't a problem. He's just a bump. And my wife can take care of that bump. And she did, four or five times. And you know what happened? Mike got fatter. He did. He grew. And the last time that she tried to kick Mike out, Mike said, I'm going deeper. I'm not coming out. And Mike went deeper. And it got all great big, about the size of a baseball on my back. And it hurt like the dickens. And I thought I was a big baby before, but I'm convinced now I'm, I'm a big baby. But I finally realized I've got to do something with Mike. He's got to go. He can't stay. He's not welcome any longer because he's keeping me from enjoying my life. You see, without the recognition of sin in our life, without recognition of the need to get back on course, we'll never make the decision to do that. If David had denied what Nathan came to him with, he would have stayed off course. And we wouldn't know David as the greatest king of Israel. What we'd have known is David as another list of kings who came and went and failed. 
it's important for us to understand we have to recognize that sin and you have to admit that it's there if you can't do that you'll never fix the problem and you'll never allow God to have the place in your life that he has to have won't happen the second thing this morning that I that I think we we misunderstand sometimes is because there are good people in this world do you agree there are some really good people that are really smart, that are really giving and generous and lying, kind and loving. They're just really good people. The problem is they don't recognize the fact that they were born sinful. It's been in you from the day one. In fact, David says, from the time that I was conceived in my mother's womb, that's how long I've been sinful. In fact, we foster that in our lives don't we 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 teach our children the most important thing is you don't let somebody shove you around don't let somebody pick on you you're the most important thing you take care of you because nobody else is going to right isn't that what our society teaches us look out for what for number and who's number one that's what we that's what we teach it's what we that's what our culture cultivates in our lives and it leads us to the idea that I'm good enough you see the original sin that we're born with has to be forgiven it has to be erased it has to be eradicated it has to be taken out of play maybe you are a good person maybe you do good things and Maybe you're kind and generous and loving. Maybe you send cards to sick people. I don't know. But I know this. If that original sin is never taken out of you, you'll never get to where you want to be. And you'll be sick your whole life. We call it self-centeredness because it's all about us and not about him and not about anyone else. In fact... This morning, if you look all the way back over to the book of John, look over in the book of John in chapter 3, there's a, there's a leader, a Jewish leader that comes to, to Jesus in the middle of the night because he's afraid that somebody might see him. And he says, hey, hey, how, how do I get to heaven? And Jesus says, unless a man be born again, it doesn't happen. Nicodemus is confused. How can a man enter into his womb, his mother's womb again? And a second time, how does that work? And Jesus goes on to explain to him that it's not a physical birth, but a spiritual rebirth. You see, it, it corrects the course that we are, we are on from being self-centered to being God-centered. And if we can't recognize that that is in our life, if we can't understand that that's a part of it that we have all sinned we were born with it and we can't get it out of there we remain sick our whole lives it's that simple you didn't do anything wrong in this world you were just born with it how many of us if a child was born with some kind of deformity and there was a way to fix it we'd say nah i think they're okay not a one of us would would we and yet we're willing to live with original sin as part of our life and be self-centered our whole life without, without the help of God to correct that. And when I think of it in terms that way, I think that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Why would you not if you knew how to? But then I look at myself and I say, you had that for 15 years. Why didn't you just go to the doctor and let him cut it out? And it had been over with. Because sometimes we're just stupid. That's the truth. And we live in denial. And that's not a river in Egypt. It's important for us to understand this morning. You can be as nice as you want. You can be as loving and kind as you want. But if you've never allowed God to remove that original sin, if you've never asked for forgiveness for that, all of it's in vain. And you'll still have sin that separates you from God. 
You say, well, I don't know if I believe that. Well, it's right there in Psalms. David says, surely I've been this way since birth. My whole life, all I've cared about was myself. My whole life from day one was all about me and not about you. And he recognizes the need to have that fixed. It's important for us to understand this morning, and I'm repeating myself over and over again because I want us to leave here with one thought in our head, and that is the sin in your life will separate you from God. It absolutely will separate you from God. And if it's not corrected, you'll be off course your whole life. And when it ends, you'll still be off course. And you won't land where you think you want to land. Sin. It's a bad thing. And then the last point this morning that I, I want you to understand is there's a cure. Aren't you glad for that? I am, I'm glad that there is an option to fix this thing and get Mike out of my life. I'm glad that the doctor just didn't go, well, if you'd have come to me the first time, could have fixed it, but now it's, it's too late. He's just going to live with you forever. I'm telling you, that would have been a miserable existence. And you guys probably wouldn't have liked me very well after a while because I get grouchy when I get hurting. And I look at this and I say, there's a cure. Thank God there's a cure. And it's His cure for all of that that separates us. You didn't have to do anything to earn it. You didn't have to be special. You didn't have to, to have all the right answers. None of that. He came up with the solution for us and said all you got to do is believe in me and if you'll ask Peter tells us if you'll ask he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins aren't you glad for that this morning I am thankful that he didn't just leave us here to wallow in it and go well you guys messed that up I had the perfect plan and the perfect situation, and you guys could tear up a brand new Mack truck. You're done. I'm thankful this morning that God said, I desire a relationship with you so much that I am willing to do whatever it takes to get you here. I'm thankful this morning. I'm not worthy of it. None of us are. But he gives it anyway. Aren't you glad for that this morning? I am so glad. I hope this morning that you can find this passage of Scripture encouraging. I know the first part of my sermon is not very encouraging about sin. I, I understand that. But the last part should way outweigh that first part. And that is the fact you have the answer right in front of you today. And all it takes is you simply saying... Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. That's all it takes. And it's a done deal. And it's over. They tell me here in a few months that I'm going to go in and they're going to put me to sleep. And I, Mike's got a little brother, Nick. He lives on my spine. And he's just a, he's just a little feller. But I said, you know what? I learned them little fellers turn out to be big fellers. And Nick's going to go with Mike wherever Mike goes. So I want you to understand, I'm not just going to take care of Mike. I'm going to take care of Nick at the same time. So that when I come out of there, I'm Mike and Nick free. Okay? And this morning, I want you to understand, you don't have to have a list that you go, Lord, can you forgive me for that? And can you forgive me for that? And can you forgive me for that? I promise you, he already knows what you've done. And all he needs to hear is that you want forgiveness for that and you want a restored relationship with him. I want you to read with me this morning. Rick, I'm going to start down there in verse, uh, verse 8. 
Okay? Now let's start in verse 6. Sorry? Verse 6, Rick. And he says this. David says, Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. And then he says this. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I'll be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. And then if you jump on down to verse 10, he says this, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. What's he asking for? You see, he's asking for God to take that original sin out and cleanse my heart don't make me david centered anymore make me god centered that's what he's wanting is that what we desire in life do we desire for god to be at the very center of it regardless of what goes on around us or in our lives do we still desire to have god at the very center of our being be honest with yourself because even if you're not honest with yourself, I promise you God already knows. And the only way to fix it is to admit you've got a problem. We've already discussed that, right? So let me ask you this morning. Are you praying the prayer of David? Do you know that God can cleanse you and make you whiter than snow? And he can turn sin to righteousness in an instant? And if you know that, have you done it? And if you haven't done it, why haven't you done it? It makes no sense to be sick with a cure in front of you and not take it. It makes no sense. What is it I wanted you to remember this morning when you left? Sin separates us from God. God cannot exist in the same space as sin. If there's sin in you, God cannot be in you. He cannot be in you. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you do. Scripture tells me that God and sin cannot and will not exist in the same space. So don't tell me it's a white lie. That it doesn't matter. It's sin. In my very first class uh, to, be, to become a pastor, studying to be a pastor, uh, my professor started out <clears throat> talking and one of the guys in class started to tell a joke. And uh, it was a joke about sin. And the professor stopped him. He said, I want to tell you a story that happened to me when I was in college. And he's old by now. Uh, he's passed away. His wife used to be um, the district secretary, Sandy. Richard was his name. And uh, he had a Ph.D. He was an extremely smart man, a very holy man. And he told this story. He said, I went in. He said, I was the assistant to the professor, and he said, I went in to class one day to help him with papers or whatnot, and I just heard this great joke as I was coming across campus, and I wanted to share it with him. And he said, hey, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a, a minister and a, and a priest and a rabbi, and they all walk into a bar. And, and the professor looked at him and said, just stop right there. And he said, is this a joke about sin? He said, well, I suppose it is a little bit. And he said, son, there's nothing funny about sin. There's nothing funny about sin. I want you to understand this morning. I love to laugh and joke. I love the fact that we can, uh, we can tell stories among each other and we can smile and we're great friends. But I want you to know this morning, there's nothing funny about sin. How can it be funny if it causes you to miss heaven? How can it be funny if it causes you to be separated from God? It can't be. It just can't be. 
sin is a serious thing in our life. It's probably, not probably, it's probably the most important thing in our life. It's probably the most dreadful thing that we could have in our life. So don't tell me it's just a joke, lighten up, preacher. And don't tell me it's a little white lie. And don't tell me nobody knows. Because when you leave here today, if you leave with that, you leave without a relationship with Jesus. That's what you leave with. It's important. It's important that we understand sin separates us from God. Don't miss the train. <laughs> Stand with me, would you please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for mercy, for grace, for loving us even when we are unlovable, for still coming, us, coming after us and chasing us even when we don't want to be found, even when we don't think we need to be found. Lord, and thank you for convicting us of sin even when we don't think it's that serious. Lord, I just pray this morning that you would help us to understand the seriousness of sin. That anything that separates us from you is serious. We thank you for times of fellowship and getting together and being able to laugh and enjoy this life. We know that you created us for that and you created this life for it. Lord, we just pray that you'd help us not to forget that sin separates us from you. Lord, as we leave this place this morning, would you make us mindful? Not just today, not in just this moment, but every moment that sin separates us from you. Lord, help us this week to maintain a relationship with you that is holy and righteous and acceptable as our spiritual act of worship. Lord, we love you today. We give you praise and glory for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.